welcome to the Inside Source Executive Interview Series. My name is Dawn Tura. I'm the President and CEO of Sourcing Industry Group. And today I'm here with Teresa Payton, and she's the former White House CIO Cybersecurity Authority and expert on identity theft. So your background is amazing. I mean, you were named one of the top 25 most influential women, well, people in Security Magazine, and most respected authorities on internet security, data breaches, and fraud mitigation. You were the first female at the White House uh, Chief Im Information Officer. You ever saw the IT for the President and his staff from 2006 to th 2008. So let's just start there. That is amazing. So tell me about that experience. It was a great honor. Uh, it's a job like no other. Uh, it, we were just talking about this earlier. It can be as you know, sort of the regular mundane of making sure data gets over to payroll and that people get paid <laughs> all the way to, hey, the president's going to take um, a trip over to the Middle East and you need to send a team in advance to make sure we can protect the communications and make sure that people can actually work and get their job done while they're over there. And so, you know, just always uh, something different and always with the focus of leave things better than we found it. Mm -hmm. They're trying to make sure not only are we running things for today, but that we're setting things up for administrations to follow. Be interesting. So what did you take away as the biggest um, aha as being, you know, CIO at the White House? I mean, that's a big deal. So what would you recommend also to the person who's CIO today? Well, you know, a couple of things, and the, the first thing is, is you n never forget who you are there to serve, and mm -hmm. it's, it's not only the current administration, but it's the administration after you, and so always be thinking about, you know, sort of that, and it's not too dissimilar from challenges CIOs have in the private sector, which is how do you deliver the latest and greatest technology, cutting edge technology that they deserve, mm -hmm. they deserve to have it, just like your customers deserve to have it. But how do you do it in such a way that you're balancing the trade-off with security and privacy? And it's really a case-by-case -case decision that has to be made. So the, the technology, the cutting-edge technology you may use for a certain level of role at the White House versus the president may be different based on sort of the, the role and the communications and the rank. And you, it's kind of not too dissimilar if you think about it in the private sector same thing, you, know, you may have information like trading memos around that, you know, using the latest, greatest technology, if it's mm -hmm. not a memo about intellectual property, you know, maybe it is okay to use cloud services or to use something like that. Whereas if it's something about a merger and acquisition or intellectual property, you may not wanna be on the latest, greatest technology because you could put, put that asset at risk. So always just trying to, I, that would be the advice I give to anybody who's in the role, which is, you know, don't really, don't forget who you serve and then understand that as you're delivering technology that people are trying to get in and they will get in and the, and the question is mm -hmm. what are the strategies that you've deployed to make sure that if they get in they can't get away with everything. All right, so cybersecurity is one of the top top of mind issues that we have today. I mean we're talking about risk from every aspect from human trafficking to conflict minerals, but cybersecurity is huge. We represent the office of CPO and we contract with everybody and we can introduce risk into the supply chain that was never there before. You know, third-party supplier, you know, an HVAC supplier, VPNing into a system. So how would you, what would you tell a CPO today to watch out for? What should they do? Well, a couple of things. And, you know, the first one is make sure that as a company that you've had the conversation around what are the top most critical assets that we have. So, for example, if someone were to come in and steal them and hold certain assets for ransom, which that's happening. Ransomware mm -hmm. is, is up over 100%. Or post them on the internet. Mm -hmm. That you as a company would cease to exist or you would have a very hard time being profitable again. And once you understand what that short list of assets are, as it relates to contracts with third-party suppliers and vendors, you want to look at will they in some form or fashion be impacting these assets? Will they connect to our network? Do they transport these assets? Do they make the assets? Do they copy them? What, do they ever access them? And then based on that, make sure that you've got the right service level agreements in place with these companies. You know, a lot of times I find that, uh, so for example, if they have a data breach, but it doesn't involve your data, do they ever have to notify you? Right. 
and they I think they should you don't need to know the details of mm -hmm. it was this customer name but you do need to know that somebody else was breached what the situation was to make sure you don't have the same situation where you are the other piece is you know asking for them to meet a certain set of minimum standards and guidelines that is at least what you're expected to meet either for regulatory reasons or for customer trust and loyalty reasons and making sure that vendor is either doing a self-evaluation or you have an opportunity to do surprise visits or reviews of those vendors. You're not gonna do that for every vendor, but for the ones that are talking to your most critical assets that could be sort of that weakest link in your security supply chain, you definitely wanna have that in place. But most of us don't do that. I mean, we do 80% of our employees, we do a background check and only 20% of the companies we contract with, and yet most of our breaches are with second and third party contractors. Mm -hmm. So how far down, is it second tier, third tier, fourth, fifth, how far do you go until you say, all right, we're safe? Well, you know, there's a couple of things you can do there. Uh, so again, <clears throat> if it's sort of not the less critical assets that we're talking about, what you can do is say, we're holding you accountable, mm -hmm. that if you are subbing pieces of this out, that you are going to self-certify that you've held them accountable. Now, as it relates to those top one, two, or three most critical assets, you have to go a couple layers deep. And even if it's as simple as, you know, sometimes those subcontractors are so small, they don't even have the capability, they don't even understand the questionnaire exactly. that you have mm -hmm. asked them. And so what you want to do is you want to have those agreements in place with your first, you know, first tier, second tier, third tier sub around cyber liability insurance and making sure that if there is a breach and it, ha it involves their supply chain, you know, the different tiers, that the appropriate coverages and riders against exclusions are, are covered in that cyber mm -hmm. liability insurance. And then the other thing to do is to practice a digital disaster. So you may not be able to do a full evaluation, that's probably not practical, but if you once a year do a digital disaster with those vendors and have them on the call and have them go through the exercise, you're gonna learn where their gaps are and what they're missing and so right, are so they. Di digital disaster, what is that exactly? Yeah, so basically sort of take your worst nightmare. Ask your CEO, what is your worst nightmare as it relates mm -hmm. to a data breach? What data element, if it mm -hmm. were stolen or put on the internet, is your worst nightmare? And then you practice it. So for example, here's an, a sample um, a digital disaster. The uh, hackers have hacked in, they've stolen your customer data. They mm -hmm. have all of their um, you know, social security number, all that kind of information, and they've posted it on the internet, and the media knows about it because security researchers and bloggers are already talking about mm -hmm. it. Your CEO and employees are coming into work that day. They are just learning that the reporter is reporting it, and the press is already in the parking lot putting microphones in everybody's face. Okay, let's go. And, and then you basically practice the okay, what are the vendors going to say and what are they going to do? And, and that's where you sort of learn what you want the protocols to be. And hopefully you'll never need them. But the time to figure that out is not during the disaster. Well, and you say hopefully you'll never need them. Do you really think most companies are not going to have a data breach? I think every company is going to have a data breach. Okay. Now, whether or not that data breach is data that's a reportable incident that's mm -hmm. going to hit the media, that's another story. But every company is going to have a data breach. And the question is, when they break in, what do they get? What do they get away with? How soon do you know? And how do you respond? Mm -hmm. The average number of days bad guys are in a corporate network before anybody knows they're there is 205. Okay. I was just going to ask you that. So I was at a Gartner <laughs> conference just recently in uh, Barcelona, and they said 274 days. And I think, oh my gosh, they're behind your firewall for 274 days or 204, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It's not just extracting, it could just be manipulating. Yeah, they can be looking at data, they can, and, and at that point, they can embed themselves in your network. Right. And there are times where we've, you know, had the discussions where you may not ever be able to trust your network again. Right. And companies are looking at, well, how would I do that? How would I rip out the network and move? I mean, it's like essentially just uprooting and moving to a new place. How would I do that? And, you know, so that, that's where really understanding these strategies and understanding the data and how to segment it off. Interesting. So we talk about the Internet of Things and big data. 
Do you think that is real? Is it something that we should really focus on? Is it something that we can actually assimilate into our organizations for cybersecurity, for data about our customers? Yeah, the Internet of Things is here. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's interesting when you think about, for example, the smart thermostats in people's mm -hmm. homes to help save on energy. I have one, and, Nest. Yeah, you mm -hmm. have Nest and uh, how you can lock and unlock your door by using yep. an app yep. and you can unlock the door at a moment to let a delivery person mm -hmm. in and then relock it again. And it affords us amazing capabilities, mm -hmm. uh, staying in touch, being more productive, there's a lot of amazing capabilities. But with that, the other side of the coin is the amount of data mm -hmm. being aggregated and collected and not really protected the right way. Right. I have a lot of concerns about, you know, there's, there's two pieces. One is sort of the moral dilemma. So now that you have the data and you can do analytics against the data, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And we haven't really defined sort of the moral compass for what to do with all the behavioral based analytics we now have on everybody with the Internet of Things. And then the second piece is if you collect it, it's going to be breached. Someone's going to want it. Bad guys want it. How are we protecting that information and what duty of care do we hold all the way down to the smart TV in your living room? Mm -hmm. how, how do we hold them accountable for that? And we've already seen where the smart TVs were spying on us. And we've already seen where, for example, great company, but Sony PlayStation Network mm -hmm. has been hit several times mm -hmm. uh, with a variety of different types of hackers and breaches. And these are devices in our home that can listen to us, that can tape us and can tell a lot about us. And so that's where I, I love the advantages it gives us, but we do have a duty of care and responsibility to both the privacy and the analytics around that data, but also the security of it. I'm more nervous than I was oh, before I met you. <laughs> like, I think this is like the way we should go. This is awesome. So it's a wake up call for all of us. It, it is. And you know what, what I would say to people is there are, sometimes this feels overwhelming and mm -hmm. I don't want people to feel overwhelmed by this, but you know, what I look at it is if you get really focused on the things that matter most mm -hmm. and just say, look, I can't, I can't protect everything. Right. But in your personal life and at work, what are the couple of things that matter the most? And then put some strategies around that. So for example, in your personal life, having an email address that's only attached to your healthcare account and nothing else. Okay. And that way, if you start to see spam on that, you know, there could be a compromise and use something else because your healthcare record is now considered more valuable oh, yes. than your debit and credit card oh, record. Yes. Way more. Um, so that, that can be a great, because everything's tied right now to email addresses, the password reset, your insurance, mm -hmm. how they notify you, and create these different email accounts that can kind of help you segment off these different parts of your life. So if they compromise the email account that's tied to your magazine and newspaper subscriptions, so what? you'll live. Right. But if that same one is tied to your bank account and your health insurance and your social media, now they have a potential way to get into everything. So that can be you know, one way to sort of segregate that off. Same thing with companies. I'm seeing where companies are getting this wire transfer fraud and it's mm -hmm. working where mm -hmm. email comes from the CEO, do the wire transfer, looks legit, money goes out the door, right. and it's too late and then the, you can't claw all the money back. Well, one of the things that companies can do to avoid this is not just training because they're, they're gonna prey on multitasking busy people mm -hmm. who want to please the boss. You get an email from the CEO, you should jump. That's the right. way that right. should work, right? If you've hired good people. Whereas if you set up some policies and procedures that says, look, we're gonna have a separate domain name, we're gonna have a separate set of credentials, those are gonna be tied to banking, and if you get a wire transfer request from me, it's only gonna come from this, and it's not my public facing email, it's this set of credentials. And oh, so now, yeah. now you have, now you're taking a little bit of control back because you're making it tougher for the bad guys to really know who you are and how you do your business. Interesting. Folks, otherwise we're out of time and hopefully you'll check in next time on our, our executive interview series. And this is Dawn Tura.